Well, good evening and welcome to Civic Engagement for All. It's wonderful to have all of you with us. A couple of weeks ago on September 17th, we celebrated Constitution Day here in the United States. As part of Constitution Day, I had the opportunity to participate in a panel discussion on the importance of the Constitution that was hosted by the president of the University of Colorado System, Mark Kennedy, who was a good friend of mine from my days at George Washington University, along with several other university presidents. One of the questions that President Kennedy asked me was, what do the ideals and precepts in the Constitution mean to our nation? As I reflected on that question, I thought about the Constitution and how it informs what it means to be a citizen here in this country. At its core, the Constitution is an agreement between our government and American citizens that indicates what powers the government has and what powers citizens have uh, and the role that we play in the governance of this country. In fact, the Constitution gives significant freedoms and a substantial voice in our government. It's a tremendous and unique privilege that we have, a privilege that billions of people around the world do not have. So we have a responsibility to participate in our country's uh, democratic and civic processes. And frankly, this year, as part of that responsibility, you have the opportunity to vote in the upcoming presidential election. At Baylor, we want every one of our students to exercise their constitutional right to vote and to become involved in the civic activities uh, wherever you might be. It is a foundational part of civic engagement and our responsibilities. At Baylor, we believe it's important for our students to understand the world around them at an academic and intellectual level. That's why we've identified civic engagement as one of four general education outcomes that we all want all students to master before graduation from Baylor. And it's why our core curriculum requires students to take a class entitled US Constitution, its interpretation and the American political experience. Many universities have abandoned all civic education in their core, but we think it's an integral part of personal development and formation. Students, you are a part of a long and distinguished line of Baylor Bears who have made a lasting impact on our nation and our state and our local communities through their civic engagement. But you don't have to be a political science major or an aspiring lawmaker to leave your mark. You each have a voice in important ways. You can make a difference in the world by getting involved and becoming engaged, and certainly by voting in the upcoming presidential election. I know you're going to enjoy the conversation this evening. We're so glad that you're with us. Thank you so much, President Livingstone. Thanks for introducing this event. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank uh, two co-sponsors of the event. One is the Office of Engaged Learning at Baylor University, and also the Washington DC based uh, American Council of Trustees and Alumni have come alongside and co-sponsored this event with us. I'm David Corey, I'm professor of political philosophy here at Baylor, and I direct Baylor in Washington DC, and I'm, I'm glad to see so many uh, students turn out for this, and I'm happy to be moderating this all-star all, all panel. Um, I am aware of the fact that there's a presidential debate uh, at eight o'clock, uh, and I'm, we're going to do everything we can to be done by then. If we're not finished, we'll be wrapping up. And I will say that if students have questions about this panel and don't have a chance to ask them, I'll be happy to stay on and just uh, field questions if others have to leave uh, because of the debate. But let me let me offer a, a sort of a philosophical frame here for the for the the panel. Um, it's it's really aimed at students, uh, students at Baylor, and students who can't join us here on campus. This is an event for you where we want to have a focused conversation about the importance of civic engagement, but also the different forms it can take. Um, it's actually depressing and astonishing uh, how little American colleges and universities do to cultivate responsible civic engagement. Baylor, Baylor is an exception. It always has been a remarkable exception to the rule. Um, as the alumni on this panel will demonstrate in a moment, Baylor has an incredible track record of graduating men and women who go on to have a tremendous impact on our political communities, local, state, national, and even international. And that, that is to be praised. And we are in part celebrating that and trying to encourage you all to imitate the kind of role models that we have on this panel. But 
the right of passage into responsible civic engagement, that whole process of coming of age as a citizen and thinking about how concretely to do good in the world, that rite of passage has certain dangers uh, that are rarely addressed by our colleges and universities. And I want to shine light on those dangers and introduce this topic by just naming three of the dangers of this rite of passage into civic responsibility. The first danger is that, and you must know people like this, that one really never becomes politically conscious at all. Or that if one does, it takes the form of a kind of a facile way of reacting to social media with little or no effort to really separate truth from fiction um, or political reality from political fiction. This danger, let's name it, I wanna call it the danger of, of ignoring political reality. And it's increasingly possible today in our hyper-specialized world where we all have small things that we're working on, but also in our hyper-technological age. That's the first danger. The second danger is different. It's, it's not that one fails to cultivate a realistic political consciousness, but that as it develops, one is overwhelmed by how incredibly alien, how other the political establishment seems. And one despairs of ever being able to break into it or to be effective in changing things for the better. That's the problem of alienation. It's a classic problem, but I think the bigger our country becomes and the bigger our national government becomes, the easier it is to fall prey to feelings of alienation and despair. And I think in its worst form, we simply feel as though, even though we're citizens in a free country that ostensibly regards people as equal, we feel that the country belongs to someone else. So that's the second danger. This is a feeling I certainly had when I was college age. And I just wish someone would have told me what all these panelists already know, which is that it's much easier than you think. And we want to reassure you that it's much easier than you think to break in and have a meaningful, meaningful impact on our political culture. The panel will demonstrate that. And no one graduating from Baylor University, no one, I don't care what gender, what race, no one from Baylor need feel alienated or shut out from political effectiveness. And finally, the third danger is perhaps the most troublesome, troublesome of all in our hyper-polarized climate. The risk is that you do in fact attain political consciousness and you do overcome your feelings of alienation, but when you go to take part in politics, you do so on the pattern of competitive sports or worse yet, on the pattern of war. In other words, you hastily assess that this is a winner take all situation composed of good people arrayed against bad people, friends and enemies, and you equate poli political engagement with warring for the side that you want to win. And the other side, you sort of hate on them. And you try to defeat them. This is a deeply problematic approach to politics. And in fact, it is a fundamental misconception of what politics essentially is. That's perhaps a point for another time. But let me just say here that domestic politics is ill served by thinking of it on the model of war. Because first of all, frankly, there's no place to dispose of your enemies. It's a country. And secondly, also, there's really no acceptable end strategy for that war. And as anybody who has studied war will know, a war without an end game is by definition an unjust war. So for students making this rite of passage into civic engagement, the war metaphor turns out to be especially deflating because one thing I can promise you that will happen in November when you go to vote is that a whole bunch of people are gonna win and a whole bunch of people are gonna lose. And again, that's the worst way of understanding what politics is, even though everyone tends to see it in that false light during an election, and that's where we are now. So there's a tendency to think of politics in terms of war. Okay, so what am I recommending? Well, 
I'm recommending that you vote, but that you resist the temptation to view all of civic engagement on the model of electoral politics with the us versus them mentality and its typical suspension of Christian charity towards those we deem our enemies. Instead, I recommend you consider that civic engagement can take many forms and that there are actually way more effective and way more community building forms than electoral politics. Everyone on this panel has, while I'm sure they vote, also used their careers in ways that have brought tremendous benefit to our communities, in ways that transcend ideological differences and improve our political world. And I would like to put these panelists forth as models uh, for you students of a more robust and constructive understanding of civic engagement. Real civic engagement is not about defeating our fellow citizens. As if that were really possible uh, or even ethical in a country that's grounded in the principles of freedom and political equality. It's about working with our fellow citizens in a way that reflects our co-ownership of this country. This country, students, is yours. Let's let these panelists share some creative ways of responding to this responsibility. You'll see I've got a diverse representation of people here hailing from different sociological backgrounds and professional disciplines, but they all have their Baylor education in common. And I simply want to interview them briefly about the different creative ways they've approached civic participation. So let me start now with Ben Aguanaga, um, who graduated in 2012. Ben, um, tell us what you majored in at Baylor. Sure. Well, thanks, first of all, for, for allowing me to be here. It's a pleasure to, to be here. So I majored in political science and philosophy when I was at Baylor. And then, um, am I right, you went to law school at LSU? That's right. I went which, is to also, yeah, which is also where I did my PhD, by the way. That's yeah. right. I had forgotten about that. That's, it's a great place. It's very different than Baylor. Um, uh, I, I will, I'd be lying if I said that I went uh, uh, not solely because of the good football. Um, uh. <laughs> it, was a, it was a nice perk. And then um, a lot of people go to law school and they want to be um, involved in a big firm as fast as possible and frankly make a lot of money. And I look at your background and after going to law school, what I see is served, served, served. Uh, I mean, so three clerkships, uh, one on the Supreme Court with Justice Sam Alito, uh, Chief of Staff of the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice, uh, United States Senate Judiciary Committee. That's a lot of high level civic engagement. And I point out uh, that if your chief desire were simply to make money, you could have gone about it in a much easier way when did you first start thinking about your career in terms of public service? You know, I think uh, when I was in undergrad, definitely when I was in law school, I always had it in the back of my mind that it'd be really interesting to, to go into public service in some capacity. But, um, you know, I, I had no idea what that exactly would look like. Um, so when I was in law school, somebody told me that um, it's fairly common for recent law graduates to um, do what's called a one-year clerkship with uh, a judge, um, which means you spend a year with that judge and two or three other co-clerks helping that judge research and write um, opinions. And um, it was pitched to me as a way to gain experience, to develop a connection with the judge. Um, and so I applied for that, um, for the first clerkship, the second clerkship. And when I was in the clerkship, so it's when it really kind of hit home for me, the the immense role that I was undertaking as a law clerk. Um, now, I'm not the one, I wasn't the one with the Article Three commission when the president, um, but I was able to help somebody who had that commission. And day in and day out, a judge's role is to, um, to render justice, um, equal justice under law without um, partiality, um, without looking to um, put a thumb on the scales in terms of who appeared before the judge. And I really enjoyed that. That was a very kind of fulfilling exercise to walk into chambers each morning and talk with the judge about what cases we were going to work on for that day. Um, because at the end of the day, when the opinion goes out, when the judgment's rendered, um, 
you're impacting lives directly. And that was, um, that was one of the first moments where, as I say, it really hit home for me that when you serve in a role as a law clerk with a judge, um, you're not sitting in an ivory tower um, with the luxury of just putting words on a page that have no practical consequences. Um, at the end of the day, there are real world consequences on individuals' lives, on, on corporations, um, on the government, whoever the litigant is that appears before you in the case. Um, so that was when I think it really kind of materialized in my mind that um, public service is very rewarding, um, in, especially in the legal space, because at the end of the day, you're, you're looking to render equal justice in the law. Well, I, there are two things about that that are just so encouraging and impressive, and I wanted to just spotlight them for our students. Um, one is how quickly out of law school you're basically doing some incredibly high-level legal work. Um, I mean, without giving away any Supreme Court secrets, did you have a, a hand in writing any any opinions on the Supreme Court, or <laughs> how, how 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 influential do you were you as as a as a clerk? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I I will say you know Justice Alito was. Uh, lucky to survive the term with me on board because uh, I could only drag him down. You know, I, I, you know, I can't speak to specifics, but um, at the Supreme Court level, look, we're 28, 29, 30-year-olds helping the justice on the Supreme Court decide cases that have immense, immense consequences um, nationwide, sometimes internationally. And um, I was under no illusion that, that any of us really deserved to be there. Um, it was a blessing and an honor um, but, you know, even, even there, um, that's where it, it really, the gravity of what you're doing as a law clerk hits home because, um, any one of those nine justices can, um, can do the job on their own. Um, it's a luxury for law clerks to be able to tag along and, and purport to help the justice along. Um, but those are the perfect kinds of opportunities for young attorneys um, and you emphasize young for young attorneys to dive in and help um, an attorney at the peak of his or her profession decide cutting edge legal issues. Um, it's just an unparalleled experience. I, I also want to say to the students that Ben is a testimony to the fact that you don't have to have gone to Harvard <laughs> to land a, a really impressive clerkship on the Supreme Court. Thanks to Ben, uh, several of us on the Baylor and Washington team got to have dinner with Justice Alito and Ben, close your ears, but all he did was brag about Ben. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what a terrific clerk he was, and in fact, better than those, um, school, those Ivy League schools up north. And that's true. That's true. So um, I, I think sometimes students can get worried that if they don't place in the top you know, 5% of schools, they shouldn't strive for really meaningful careers. And I think that's, that's dead wrong. It's, it's a serious mistake. I think if you do really well at any law school, um, doors are open to you. And, and you can do just as well as anybody else. You can no, that's exactly right. I mean, I think, um, like, look, if, if you clerk at the Supreme Court, the, the competition's fierce. Um, but one of the encouraging things from my term at the court was, um, as you say, I graduated from LSU, a state law school. Um, one, of my, one of the clerks at the court graduated from Vanderbilt Law School. Um, one of my co-clerks uh, graduated from the George Washington Law School. Um, there was somebody there from I think, Ole Miss. In the past, there have been some from the University of Texas, from the University of Georgia law schools, um, all sorts of schools that don't immediately come to mind when you think Ivy League. Um, but there are justices on the court who, who really kind of set aside the name of the law school and look to you as, a, as an individual, as a human being, um, and examine you on your own merits. Um, and so I'm very fortunate to Justice Alito for, um, for giving me that honor. Thank you, and thanks for these remarks. I'm going to maybe circle back to you in a minute, but let me let me um, mention Roshanda Farmer Neal, whom I'd like to just point out did her masters at Baylor. Um, Roshanda, thank you for being on the panel. You you work at Baylor right now. Can you tell me what your masters was in? Uh, political science. Oh, that, that, that's that's just perfect. Yeah, what degree did you get that MA? What what year did you get that MA? Uh, 1993. Okay, and now, and you did some things in public service prior to what you're doing now, and maybe you can say a word about them. Um, what'd you do before you got to Baylor? Uh, before I came to Baylor, I actually was working for the state of Texas, and I was working in the criminal justice area, which uh, actually led me to Baylor. I, working in that field, 
I was working with a lot of different people from different environments and different backgrounds. And it was one individual particular that comes to mind. He had served time in, in, uh, in a criminal justice institution here in the state of Texas. He had returned home and we were trying to locate employment for him, but no one would hire him with a felony uh, history. Yeah. So it was difficult trying to locate uh, employment for individuals with a felony. And I kept trying to make a difference and I realized that I couldn't in the position that I was in. So um, I returned to get my master's in political science um, based on my recommendation from my father. So uh, he encouraged me to come to Baylor to get my master's and I ended up in political science. And um, it was in a political science class here on campus that I realized that I wanted to be a lobbyist and that being a lobbyist, I could make changes to state laws that would help individuals. And so that was my goal from sitting in the classroom over in Draper. Um, I decided that's what I wanted to do and that's how I can make um, change positive changes that would impact others lives. And then, and then I, I've had the privilege of working with you since I started director, directing Baylor in Washington. We work together a lot, um, but, I, I, and I, but I regard what you're doing now as still um, public service, but, but sort of focused at Baylor, uh, both in terms of serving Baylor, but also in terms of serving Baylor's students to learn how to become ambassadors. Um, could you describe your, your title or what you, what what your position is called is Director of Governmental Relations, but what does that involve? Okay, so that still is a lot of um, civic engagement. I have the opportunity in this position to work with uh, local officials, state officials, and um, federal officials. And so in this position, prior to coming to Baylor, I mean, after I received my master's, I actually worked in Austin and did a lot of legislative work, but my job right now I serve as a liaison in a sense um, for the university to elected officials to governmental entities. Um, we track legislation, looking at the impact it has on the university. Um, there's legislation that you wouldn't think that would impact the university. In addition to you know what impacts our students, but we have environmental issues, we have transportation issues. Um, housing issues, child care issues. So there's a lot of issues that we look at. And so in this position, I have the opportunity to follow legislation, um, provide information, advocate on issues that um, help our students. I also get to work with our local officials in the local communities and serve on uh, the Greater Chamber, uh, Greater Waco Chamber of Commerce in their policy group. So I get to work with business officials and we look at uh, workforce. Uh, we also look at um, just pre-K uh, education in addition to higher ed. So there's a lot of opportunities just as being the director of government relations. Um, yeah, thank you. And you know, Rashad, I mean, in relation to the way I set things up in the intro, what, what I think this shows is that, I mean, you're out there building community, building connections helping Baylor be connected to Washington and, and people who are interested in universities be connected to Baylor. This is really constructive political engagement and it's not tearing people apart. It's actually really bringing people together. And um, I wondered if you would say a word about Baylor Ambassadors, which has been such a flagship program for Baylor. You direct it. Sure, um, this is an awesome group, the best organization on campus. <laughs> uh, um, I love my Baylor ambassadors. Um, they, this is a student organization. Right now, we have 37 members that are Baylor ambassadors. These are students who advocate. We train them. They learn how to go before state and federal officials and advocate for financial aid, for environmental issues that impact uh, their peers. One success that I can say that the Baylor ambassadors have had, if anyone comes to Waco or go to the um, federal monument site, the Mammoth site, the Baylor ambassadors had a part in that. They actually advocated 
for that to become a federal monument. Mm -hmm. So they are active, they are civic engaged, they're sponsoring a voter registration drive um, next week with other student organizations. So um, the Bela ambassadors, we have some now that's working in the White House. Um, we have some alumni that work at the state capitol. We have some that works for the Department of Justice and the State Department. I mean, and some serving locally in the community. So. Yeah, that's terrific. So students um, put Baylor ambassadors on your on your radar. Um, the one thing I wanted to close with with you, Rashonda, is that in addition to this kind of professional service, which you're you've made a career. I also know you're very active in our community as a volunteer. Um, and I wondered if, and I think that's important for students to know because even before students start their careers, they can volunteer in Waco in extremely meaningful ways. And that's a way of engaging civically. Could you just say a word about, I know you're on several boards. I know you're active in Waco's community. Would you just briefly say a word about that? Sure, I think, um, I guess this starts, you know, when you grow up and you have parents that's active in the community you learn that that community is it's not, um, I believe the community is, it will be the best it can be if the citizens and the residents within that community are active and involved in it. So if everyone can be involved in the community um, and provide your input, whether, whether it's small or large, whether you serve on boards or if you just, you know, volunteering at your local Salvation Army, you know, serving or providing donations, that's, that's doing something to better your community. And I look at it as if, if I can just go to the Salvation Army and serve a meal, or if I can provide a donation um, to someone that may be in need, or if I can serve on a board and pro provide input, um, based on my experience and what I've grown up with, um, I think that's very important. So no matter how small or how large, I think everyone should give back to their community because it's not, the community will not grow without you uh, putting something into it. Yeah, it also directly addresses this problem of alienation that you can actually just go out right now and participate with the community. It's right there, you can volunteer. Right. Um, I'm going to circle back to you in a minute. Um, okay. I'd, I'd like to introduce um, Sparky Matthews. Uh, you can tell that Sparky is not Sparky's real name, and I'm <laughs> not going to. I'm not going to tell you why he was nicknamed Sparky uh, when he was in the Air Force. Uh, his real name when he was at Baylor, his friends called him Walter Matthews. We call him Sparky. He was a colonel. He graduated. He was a colonel in the Air Force before coming to Baylor. He's my new colleague this year. We're so honored to have you, Sparky. You graduated from Baylor in 92, you went to med school, and then things went a little different from what usually happens when people graduate from Baylor and go on to Baylor Med School. Usually they become um, very wealthy physicians. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not saying you're not a wealthy man, but I, I do know you made a funny turn there. You joined the military. What, right. what were you thinking there? And, and was, was civic engagement in your mind or or was it other things? So, uh, how, what were you thinking there? So that's a great question, and David, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Uh, I'm I'm a bit of an unusual participant in this panel because uh, it's you know everyone else uh, that uh, we're speaking to tonight <clears throat> went into the government, went into the political world uh, to affect the civil society. Uh, I actually went into the, the, uh, the U.S. government uh, of sorts, Department of Defense, to protect the civil society uh, in a way that actually our other panelists do as well. Um, so I joined the Air Force uh, out of Baylor University uh, with the Health Profession Scholarship Program uh, as a way to pay for medical school. And uh, I, I, was, uh, I was on my own. My, my parents uh, helped me get through Baylor. Uh, but then after that, I was on my own. And so the Air Force was a great way to go through school. Uh, I'm eager to talk to any student uh, that is interested in looking at the military as a, as a uh, way to pay for school. 
But I was one of those rare individuals that uh, once I got there, I found my greatest love. Uh, aerospace medicine uh, is what, my, what I trained in and decided to devote my life to the service of my country uh, in the Air Force. And uh, I know I've got several students that are, are joining us on the, on the panel or uh, watching this tonight, and they will recognize uh, what I'm about to say. Uh, I, I never intended to be involved in the senior part of, of the, you know, the, the senior leadership in the U.S. government, but I made it a habit to do the best job I could and the job I had at the time. Uh, and that allowed me to continue to move up uh, within the Air Force. And I ended up uh, retiring recently on the 1st of August as the first Surgeon General of the United States Space Force. So I had the opportunity to serve in a very unique way, a very exciting way. Uh, and so that, that, that's kind of my story, uh, the way that I got into government, if you want to say government. Uh, I was there really to protect the government more than anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm, I've got a question that I, I worked hard to figure out. I think your students will appreciate it. Um, you've noticed that I've, got, I've gotten people here from, from different discipline backgrounds. So, you know, Sparky in a way is a testimony to what somebody doing biology right now at Baylor could do. And um, I got to read this question just to get it just right. Um, uh, if Baylor biology majors wondered how they could ever do anything meaningfully civic, what are some of the things you did where looking back, you realized, wow, you were, you were actually a pretty effective citizen. You were actually doing something pretty high level. And maybe, fa maybe Space Force is, is the way you want to answer that question, but I'll let you answer it any way you want. Well, thank you. And so many different ways throughout my career, I was able to contribute to our society. Uh, most of it was in a protective measure. Uh, so I, I've responded to multiple natural disasters, both uh, in the United States and uh, abroad. Uh, I have deployed three times uh, uh, to, to war zones uh, where I have um, uh, pursued our national security strategy uh, in uh, fairly unique ways. Uh, and with, with the Space Force, uh, what, what an amazing opportunity to, uh, to really establish the foothold of how we will practice medicine in space. So not, not to, to support those that are going to space, but to go to space and practice medicine. For my students, they've heard me talk about uh, performing surgery on the moon. That's something that we are going to do and we're going to do within the potential uh, career lifetimes of the students that are joining us tonight. So if you're, if you're interested in being the first surgeon to, uh, to perform a procedure, an appendectomy on Mars, uh, I can help you get there from here. I also noticed that as soon as you've joined us here at Baylor, you've been swept up into the uh, COVID prevention task force. And that's another way now you're serving Baylor. What, 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 how, why did you, how did you have the background for that? So I, I'm also boarded in general preventive medicine and public health. And as the Surgeon General for the Space Force, I was involved at the, the most senior levels of the U.S. government in discussing how we would respond, how we did respond to COVID-19. So. Uh, was on routinely in conversations uh, on video teleconferences with uh, the surgeon to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to the other uh, service surgeons, so the Surgeon General of the Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, as well as Dr. Fauci, the CDC uh, director, uh, the uh, FDA director, just to share our knowledge about how we would respond and, and what we needed to do, where our priorities needed to be to try to control and stop the spread of this disease. Unfortunately, control is really all, all that we can do. Uh, humanity's not quite at the point where we can stop a disease in its tracks like this. Um, but when I retired from the Space Force and, and came to Baylor, uh, I was looking forward to a certain extent to blessed anonymity uh, and unfortunately did not get the opportunity to, uh, to live in obscurity for very long. So, but I am, I am, uh, extraordinarily blessed to be able to bring the experience that I have and the training that I have uh, to Baylor to be able to, uh, to, to assist the university to be really one of the premier institutions in this country in the way we have responded to COVID-19. And that is uh, empowering and informing our students to know how to deal with this the right way. And they are. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. I mean, it, it's really an example of how starting from a Baylor degree, uh, you find your you find doors open. And I'm not I'm not saying that you didn't work hard, but you didn't find doors slammed in your face. You saw many opportunities to be effective as a citizen and to really make a difference in our political community. And I look forward to our friendship as colleagues over over the years to come. Uh, so thank you. And David, can, if I can say that the most important door that that opened was the last door that opened up for me to come home to Baylor. Yeah, <laughs> we're glad to have you back. And, and I want to turn finally to Victor Boutros. And, and Victor, just let me say a couple words before I ask you to speak. I just want to mention that you graduated from Baylor in 98 and you went on to Harvard. I think you did your law degree at Harvard. Would you not, if that's true? Actually, I did a master's degree at Harvard and then one at Oxford and then law, law at Chicago. So it's okay. So then he masters at Harvard, mastered at, at Oxford, and then on to do the law degree at Chicago. Yep. And you've received this coveted um, Grawmeyer Prize for, it's a book prize, for, quote, ideas impacting world order uh, for your co authored uh, uh, book, Locus Effect Why the End of Poverty Requires the End of Violence. It's a tremendous prize to have received. Um, so clearly, you're a great example of how a Baylor student can have a major impact on political communities, not just um, not just our national community, but the international community. Would you mind saying a few words about how you were thinking early on in terms of civil engagement? Were you thinking early on in terms of civil engagement, or were you more laser beam focused as an attorney trying to just uh, do litigation? When did you start thinking about making a real contribution to politics? I think it really started before I even went to law school. I started traveling, uh, especially in the developing world, uh, as a graduate student at Harvard with some other students in a, in a Christian ministry there called InterVarsity. And um, it was then that I began to see these very unique ways in which people in the developing world were suffering. I knew that there would be homelessness and hunger and sickness, and those are very visible almost the moment you walk outside the airport. Um, but as I began to meet people there, I discovered that there's another category of suffering which was this suffering of uh, injustice, where another human being was intentionally using their power to take from them the good things that God had given them. Uh, and particularly was struck by learning about um, modern slavery and, uh, and sex trafficking. And it came to me in the form of one particular case involving a 12-year-old girl in India who had um, been sent to the big city by her, her family, which was quite poor, and she gets a job in a restaurant washing dishes in the back to earn some summer money for the family. At the end of that summer, she gets ready to go back to her village and has to catch a train in Victoria Station, which is this very chaotic, busy station. She's having trouble finding her train. I've got a 12-year-old daughter. I can't imagine her trying to navigate the chaos of Victoria Station. And she's having some trouble, and a couple of older women approach her and offer to help. And she's relieved that these ladies are looking out for her. They're actually on the same train. They start moving uh, together on the train. They start chatting and have some tea. And it turns out the tea is drugged. And so she is knocked out cold. And when she wakes up, she finds herself on the third floor of a brothel in the red light district of Mumbai, where these two women have sold her for the equivalent of 250 American dollars. And from that point forward, she's told, you're gonna have to service seven to 12 customers a day, seven days a week, that's her quota. And she said, I just wanna go home. And they said, it's not an option for anymore. They begin to beat her with metal pipes and electric cords and, um, and from that point forward, that just became her daily reality. And meanwhile, her parents are over here at the rural train station. They have no idea where she is or, or how to even begin to search for her. And as I learned about her story, it, it, it just made my blood boil. I thought, how do you do that to a 12-year-old? And over time, I learned that her story was not an anomaly, but it's replicated on this massive scale around the globe. And to be honest, I felt that sense of alienation, of despair, of like, wow, nothing we do is going to make a dent. Like, I feel like you got to get this girl out now. But when I learned about the scope of the problem, I actually felt completely overwhelmed. I felt like, man, I'm getting too close to a fire that I can't put out. I got to back away. I'm going to get burned. And I had that sense of alienation. And yet I also had, I think this, probably for the only time in my life, this very clear sense of calling that this is where my gifts and this need were supposed to connect. And that's really what changed the course of my life. I ended up leaving the graduate program that I was in at Oxford early uh, to go to law school, really with the, the vision of being equipped with the skills that I thought I would need to be effective in this space. And, and then you, eventually, spent some in, yeah. you spent some time in the Justice Department? That's right, yeah, and that was, that was a dream of mine going into law school. There's a particular section at the Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division 
uh, the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division that does, um, in my view, some of the most morally compelling cases in the country. They do sort of criminal police misconduct cases, they do religiously and racially motivated hate crime cases, and they do human trafficking cases. And as I joined the Justice Department in 2007, the, the Justice Department was just building its first ever human trafficking prosecution unit. This was the first group of federal prosecutors that would have national enforcement authority and work exclusively on human trafficking cases. And so I got to be a part of that and just got a front row seat for almost a decade to human trafficking in our country and got spent time doing the investigation, directing the federal agents, uh, identifying the victims, getting the victims out all the way through trial. And that was such a um, meaningful experience for me to get to be a part of that and uh, incredibly rewarding. Could you just mention to the students what you do now in the area of human trafficking? Yeah, so uh, in 2015, I left the Justice Department to launch a new organization called the Human Trafficking Institute. And really, when I was at the Justice Department, we had successfully piloted uh, a program that significantly increased the effectiveness of the federal law enforcement response to trafficking. Uh, we had piloted this program in six districts, and within two years, those six districts had produced more convictions than the other 88 federal districts combined. The good news was that pilot was spreading in the U.S., but where it was not spreading was in the developing world, where 93% of the world's victims were. And so we launched the Human Trafficking Institute essentially to scale that successfully piloted program into the developing world, where trafficking was just exploding because there was effectively no law enforcement at all. And so I get to work with some of the um, leading enforcement, uh, trafficking enforcement uh, leaders in the world, uh, and we partner with developing countries to basically help them do three things. We help them vet and build specialized human trafficking units, teams of police and prosecutors and victim specialists that are gonna focus full-time on human trafficking. We then put them through kind of a mini law enforcement academy where we walk them through, here's the strategies that we see be effective at each stage of the process. And then we do kind of, uh, to, to, to Sparky's experience, a kind of residency where we actually hire former FBI agents, former prosecutors who move to that partner country and start officing with these units, working with them day in and day out on their cases, helping them build their skills, solve case-related challenges that come up, and help create the transparency and accountability that protects against corruption risk. And then we measure that over time to, to measure the impact of that, of that enforcement capacity. And uh, it's a, a great gift to be able to work with a, a remarkable team that we have uh, that we've been fortunate to build together. Yeah, it's terrific. Thank you so much for sharing that experience and what a, what a testimony to what's possible uh, coming out of Baylor. Um, we're coming around to the top corner of the hour and I wanted to shift to a second question that if, if folks wanted to respond to it, you could. Let me just set up the question. It, it's, I, I would wonder if you could say anything encouraging to our students uh, in light of the fact it seems to me there are two things going on that might discourage civic engagement, especially in, in the primary institutions of politics. One is how polarized our nation has become. And students might just feel kind of crestfallen and like nothing's gonna make a difference and why would I wanna sully my hands in this mess where everybody is so vociferously disagreeing with each other. That's one thing. The other thing is I wonder about the, the, the possible accidental side effects of the good thing that this country is doing over the summer and right now, which is dealing with our past racial injustices and our present racial injustices and having a conversation about race. One of the, one of the possible side effects of that is, of course, is that the concentration on racism and prejudice could lead some people of color to think, well, it's all, it's all, it's all racism all the way up and all the way down. There's, there's no reason for me to try to get into it. It might be humiliating. And I, 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 I'm more optimistic than that. I don't know if you are, but if you are, I very carefully put together a very mixed panel of here, here of people who might have different, different experiences. And I wonder if anybody would be willing to say something encouraging to students who wanna be more engaged in politics on either of those two points, the sort of political uh, polarization of our country and our current dealing with our racial past. Anyone? Well, I'm happy to jump in on the polarization topic for a moment. I think one of the most important things that we can do is something that I really learned at Baylor. Um, I remember I was a philosophy major at Baylor and I thought I was a pretty good writer and my first paper just got ripped to shreds. And one of the things that my professors really emphasized was, look, when you're critiquing an argument, you need to present that argument so well 
that the opponent would say, literally, I, I could not have said it better myself. Like you've really got it. And I would just, um, I think that kind of um, uh, charitable presentation of the other side, instead of using our sort of language to polemicize the other side, I would just really encourage that kind of active listening where I'd encourage you to go find someone who, who disagrees with you, um, who's, who's kind of on the other side of the political aisle and just go to coffee and have the sole purpose of that coffee be, all I wanna do is just listen and understand. And I wanna be able to articulate their views so well that they say I couldn't have said it better myself. That's it, that's the entire purpose. I think that that is such a rare experience for both sides um, that it is, um, it is it, it, what ends up happening, I think, when we do that is we end up finding areas of commonality and we begin to relate to it at each other, not just as members of a political party or, or a particular um, set of policies, but as, as human beings. And I think that's incredibly powerful. And I also think that, I guess the other comment I would make is think about ways that you can engage together uh, on things with, with people who disagree with you on things that you that you do agree, agree about. Um, Rashonda was talking about volunteering. Um, there are these areas. I mean, I think, you know, I think about my work a lot in the human trafficking space. This is like one issue. It's just, it's one of the, I think it's a rare issue in DC, but it's this one issue where there just is no other side of the aisle, Like, right? There's no pro-slavery contingent that people are worried about offending. <laughs> yeah. And it's this area where you have like this crazy coalition of like sort of folks on the evangelical right and the, you know, the, sec the hard secular left who don't agree on much, but on this they agree that this is a bad thing and we want to get this to stop. And then you actually get around the table and you find out that, you know, your kids are going through the same challenges and everybody's, you know, struggling with, with, with COVID and isolation. And all of a sudden the other side is not a caricature, it's a human being. And so I think that there's a kind of dehumanizing effect that can come from polarization and alienation that really is bridged a little bit by building that relationship and by starting by being an active listener yourself, really building that discipline of active listening, which I would say is just gonna help you in all sorts of categories in life as well. It's a great, great skill uh, for you to develop. I agree completely, thanks. Yeah, that's very so David, I'm, I have something to, to offer as well. Um, uh, very much what Victor was saying about, you know, a, um, uh, a, a field where there is no opposing view uh, within, uh, w within the, uh, the civil society. Uh, it is entirely possible that our students uh, just do not want to participate in the political space uh, within, you know, the U.S. society. There is a way to serve uh, and a way to give back to your country without entering the political space. In fact, by entering a space that uh, must by definition remain apolitical, and that is service in the profession of arms. Uh, and so that's something that any student that is interested in exploring that possibility, virtually anything that you want to do with your life, there's a space within uh, the U.S. military to do that. Uh, and you have the distinct opportunity to protect the civil society, even though you're not a part of the discourse within the civil society. Uh, and in fact, we, one of the things we talk about is we surrender some of our freedoms for a while while we serve. One of those is the, the freedom of speech. There are things that you cannot talk about, you cannot say when you're in uniform. Uh, but it is a way to serve if you just don't want to be a part of that political space. And to tag on to, to Sparky's point, I mean, I think uh, this is something that we experience, that the, that the Supreme Court experiences every term, which is the, the cases that grab the headlines are the close five for, you know, hot rhetoric decisions that, that that really spark everybody's passions um, on both sides of the debate. Um, and in reality, those, that sliver of decisions represents a very, very small part of the overall caseload that, um, that the court handles each term. And I think in the same ways, um, it's easy to, to see all of the hot button political issues that, that, that grab the headlines and to think that that's kind of the universe of, um, uh, political engagement that if you want to be civically engaged, that's what you have to dive into. And in reality, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Um, those who have been in government can attest to whether at the state level or at the federal level can attest to um, how many tens of thousands of, of uh, civil servants there are in government um, who spend decades of their lives in government and um, the things they do on a day-to-day -day basis never catch the headlines. And that's because for better or for worse, um, government touches 
virtually every part of our, our daily lives. Um, and so there are innumerable ways where you can, if you're interested in um, um, civic uh, engagement and, and engaging in, in your civic duty, there are numerous ways to dive into the government generally without ever touching um, these kinds of hot button political issues that you think of when you think of politics. Um, and so, yes, there are things like the Hatch Act that kind of bind you as a civil servant, right? Um, from um, engaging in political activity. And in some ways that's a blessing um, because you don't have to um, kind of throw yourself into the mix and uh, 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 the fire of, of the political rancor. Um, so I would just say that as an encouraging thing, whatever your passion is, um, whatever you major in, in undergrad, whatever you specialize in, in a, in a graduate school, um, there's a role for you in public service if you want it. And it doesn't have to be in a position that's gonna put you in the front page of the New York Times every morning. I guess I would like to, um, I would like to add, and I, I agree with Victor, I think it's, it's good to have a conversation about um, what's going on, but I think it's also important for people to also, if, listen, like if you only listen to one particular news source, or you only read one particular subscription, it's important to educate yourself. You also need to read um, someone that doesn't agree with what you're saying to understand what they're going through, what they've been through, and what they're trying to share with you so that you can educate yourself as well. Um, I, th I think that's an important way to begin the conversation. I think everyone needs to educate, um, be educated on what's going on in the world and not overlook it and not think it just involves one group of people and not the other, because there's also um, the ability for us to work together because someone of your race may not be the person that helps you it may be someone of another race. So you cannot discourage anyone and you cannot discount anyone because maybe they, they're not on your economic level. They're not, they didn't grow up in the same neighborhood that you have grown up in. So I think it's important for you to educate yourself, understand, understand what's going on in the world, understand what's going on in your community. There's a lot of nonprofits out here that are helping people and educating people. And um, I think we all owe it to our community to become educated. You know, we're all here, we all attended Baylor, we gain experience and knowledge from Baylor and we've been giving back to our community. But I think for our students, it's also important for them to reach out to others, to learn why they're on campus. And once they leave campus to continue to educate themselves. That's what I would add. That's great, thank you. Thank all of you um, for your reflections. I, I do think we have enough time to take a question or two from, from the students who are watching. We've had over 100 students on the whole time, believe it or not, it's terrific. Um, and some of these questions, I'm looking at them and they're, they're hard and they, they do reflect, unsurprisingly, uh, the kind of worry about polarization and, and, and actually some of these questions reflect the reality of polarization that even our students are, are feeling. Um, there's two in particular I think are, are really worth us trying to be helpful on. Um, I mean, both of these questions have to do with, well, what if the other team wins the election more or less? Uh, and so I don't know the students who are asking and I don't know the spirit in which they're asked, but, but these are real questions. I'm gonna put them both before us at once. One question is, um, what are a few ways we can practically work together on campus uh, politically um, if our preferred candidate does not win? And that's one of these questions. And the other is, um, is civic engagement actually a responsibility? And does it remain a responsibility, if it is a responsibility, if the candidate you didn't want to win the election wins the election? They're hard questions. I'm happy to jump in on the second. Um, I think that, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, 
the parable of the talents. I had the, the privilege of getting to give the, ser the sermon, the Labor Day sermon at my church um, and, and thought a lot about this, the parable of the talents as we did that. And I think uh, a couple of things that emerge from that are really relevant to this idea of civic engagement. One is everybody gets talents, right? Like all the servants in the parable got talents. They were entrusted by the master with talents and the master said they, that you have a responsibility to do so. He had an expectation that they would do something with those talents. They would put them out into the world and multiply them. That was the expectation the master had. And, and, and I think one of the things that emerges from that is that our choices really matter. Um, you saw that there's a difference between what happens with the, with the, the, the servant that had the five talents for, and the two talents. They multiplied them. And the, the one with the one talent who was afraid and buried his talent in the sand. There was a return in the first two cases that didn't exist in the second. Real outcomes, kingdom priorities happened in the first cases that didn't in the second. And I think that that's actually quite empowering and hopeful. It actually addresses this concern about alienation, that there, there are things that, that as, as the, the scriptures say, that there are actually good works that got prepared in advance for us to do. And there's an expectation that we do them. And when we are when we are born in this very rare circumstance in, in the scope of history of being in a democracy, then we have to think about well, what is the stewardship of that power? Where not just in a, in our electoral politics, but as as David was referencing, in other ways that we can contribute to our to the common good in our community, whether that's volunteering or engaging. A lot of times, that some of the biggest impacts that we'll make and the most tangible impacts that we make are local. Um, that, that that they're actually largely uh, separate from what's happening in the, na the national sort of climate, uh, they're, they're, actually, they're actually a little bit more tangible and a little bit more local. And so I think that um, our choices really matter and there's incredible joy in engaging these talents and putting them out there. It can feel risky, but I think it's, it's a, it's some, it, is an, it is a responsibility and obligation um, that, we get to, that we get to experience together. So that, that, that's, those are a couple thoughts on that that I would encourage people to think about. I think that's really helpful and I, I'm grateful for your bringing biblical wisdom to bear on it. What you said actually answers a question that just came in, which is what is your advice if you disagree with both major political parties in America? I struggle to find candidates that I could vote for that I would be want to represent me. Well, I think this idea about other ways you can use your talents, not in direct service to one or another party, but nevertheless, uh, as a gift to our political community in general uh, is, is the right kind of answer to that question. Anything else about these questions about how, how am I responsible to serve if, if I don't like the person who won? So David, I, I can make a comment about that. Um, I would ask in return for that question, what is the purpose of your service? Is it service to a particular political party? Or is it service to your nation? Uh, and if it's service to your nation, uh, you know, the nation is led by different people with different ideas at different times. And uh, we, our nation will not survive uh, as a civil society if we do not have various voices that are speaking into that civil society. And so to choose not to participate because you don't like who is, you know, who has the, the bully pulpit at the moment, uh, I think is, is really a mistake. Uh, because if you don't speak up when someone else is saying something that you don't agree with, then that's the only voice that's heard. That's helpful. And I would tack on, I mean, so Victor brought up, but I was actually thinking about the talents as well. And what he said brought to mind, I think what Paul says in Galatians chapter five, um, where he's talking about freedom that we're given. And in many ways, this resonates with me because, you know, in our American democracy, we, we love to talk about freedom. And what he says there is um, to not use freedom for yourself, for your own good, um, but with love to serve others. And I think that's, you know, for, for those, at least, I speak for myself, coming from a Christian background, um, it is a moral responsibility um, to use uh, not just the talents we've been given, but the political environment we've been given, the democracy that we've been given, um, to use and take advantage of that, not just for my own personal gain, um, but to serve others. And I, as, as Sparky said, I think that um, imperative holds regardless of, you know, who your mayor is, who your governor is, who your president is, um, at the end of the day, 
uh, my duty as a Christian, as an American, is to is is to serve others first, um, with myself second. Um, so that's where I come from. Uh, that's where I'm coming from on the on the responsibility to serve question. Let me, um, Rashonda, go ahead, please. You're muted. I would just like to add, I think we have a response. Well, I know we have a responsibility to vote. And even though someone wins the election that we do not agree with, we still have the responsibility to hold them accountable for, um, for the values and the morals of this, um, of this nation. So I think, it, yes, it is our responsibility to vote. And then if you disagree with who won the election, then it's your right and you have the opportunity to voice your opinion, your opinion and also um, go to Congress, go to the uh, state capitol and let your voice be known. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. I, I would love if, you'll, if my panelists will let me to tackle the last question. Uh, it's sort of right in my wheelhouse uh, as, a, as a teacher of political philosophy. The question is, and, and chime in if you want to, but Victor, I'm going to build on what you started by saying. Is there a way to honestly state your political views and your alliance on campus in ways that don't offend people with other ideologies? And I just want to make two quick points about that. I think the the idea that you're stating your views might be a slight misstep from the start. Um, because my answer, my first answer, part of my answer would be Socratically. And Socratically means um, less about stating your opinions as when you hear other people's opinions, actually ask them why they think that. And don't ask it in a hostile way, ask it in a quite charitable way. What, le what leads you to that position? To the extent that you can do that and you can understand why people have experiences that lead them to the positions that they have, you have actually made a human connection with another person. It's a very different activity from stating opinions and then stating counter opinions. I think in the war of flying opinions and counter opinions, it's hard not to offend people, but it's hard to offend people when you're genuinely asking to understand them. It's hard to offend people that way. And, and secondly, and finally, um, I would say that in stating our political opinions or doing something more Socratic, we remember that we're Christians. And one of the implications of that, this hasn't been said on the panel tonight, and it, it's an awkward thing to say actually on a panel about civic engagement. But one of the things about being a Christian is the realization that there are more important things than earthly politics. There's actually more at stake than winning the next political battle or even immediately shaping our political culture. More important is your soul and more important is the, is the project of salvation. And that absolutely requires, it absolutely requires that you be charitable. There's no salvation without charity. That's something I'm pretty sure about. And so in voicing political opinions, remember to keep politics a little bit tamped down in a kind of a Christian context. That would be, that would be something I would add. Um, I wanna thank all these panelists. Thank you for taking time to be with Baylor students tonight. I think this has been helpful. I know it has for me and I'm genuinely grateful for your contributions. So thank you so much. Oh, let me close <laughs> with this. <laughs> I wanna recommend, there's, there's a slide that I hope we can put up after this. And it's just gonna list places where Baylor students can turn if you wanna get more engaged civically. Um, so Baylor Ambassadors is one. Baylor in Washington, DC, which I direct is another. The Office for, um, the office for Civic Engagement, or it, it, um, I'm just gonna look it up really quick. But this slide is gonna come up. Nate, would you mind maybe putting it up as we say goodbye and the panelists say goodbye to, to the Baylor students who joined us. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Thanks.